All right, thank you, team. And good morning, everyone. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to stay there for the remainder of our, our time here this morning in God's Word. Thankful for the scripture reading by Matthew, and I had asked him to lead us to say the Lord's Prayer together. Thank you for joining in uh, to do that. We're going to focus on prayer this morning. Thankful last week that Al started us out on the right foot in getting into God's Word. And today we're continuing in a short series called Formed Through. And today we're talking about being formed through prayer. The title of my message is Pray Like This. And it gets into Matthew chapter 6 and that section of the Lord's Prayer. But I have to think of it this way. You know, the topic of prayer affects us in a way through a sermon about the same way as a, a sermon about financial giving would. Um, inducing a fair degree of low-grade guilt and reminding us of our failures. So if you've come today thinking of that, I want you to know you're not alone. You know, at times when you've heard sermons about prayer, you've heard people quote the greats who are really good at prayer, people like E.M. Bounds or George Mueller or Martin Luther or even the Lord Jesus himself. Um, likewise, prayers that these folks do can serve as a good example for us, but at the same time can be a bit discouraging. There is the apocryphal story of Martin Luther who said at one time that on normal days he would pray for two hours, but on busiest of days he would be so busy with tasks that he found it necessary to pray for three hours a day. All right, so let me be the first to admit that sometimes sermons about prayer can be discouraging and can bring up some of those feelings in us again. So I want to give you a quote from Martin Luther that will perhaps relate better to you and your prayer life and mine. Michael Reeves, in his short and good book, Enjoy Your Prayer Life, recounts a time when Martin Luther wrote to his friend Philip Melanchthon, apparently about something that Philip had written him about. So here's what it says. He responds to Philip, you extol me so much. Your high opinion of me shames and tortures me. Since, unfortunately, I sit here like a fool and hardened in leisure, pray little, do not sigh for the church of God. In short, I should be ardent in spirit, but I am ardent in the flesh, in lust, laziness, leisure, and sleepiness. Already eight days have passed in which I have written nothing, in which I have not prayed or studied. This is partly because of the temptations of the flesh, partly because I am tortured by other burdens." You know, Michael Reeves, when he gives that quote, he, he notes that Martin Luther was a man who loved the Lord deeply and who believed that prayer was vital and essential in his relationship with God, yet nevertheless was a very real person and a very real sinner. And maybe you can relate to that today. I know I certainly can, that you, you likewise love the Lord and you likewise think that prayer is essential and vital for your life, while at the same time you struggle with it because you too are a real person, a real sinner. And so there's hope for us. You know that prayer, on the one hand, comes naturally. If I asked you, you know, what is prayer? Many of you would, would say, well, it's talking to God. It's taking our cares and concerns to Him. Right? That's fairly simple enough. So a question would be, why don't we do that more? Why don't we grow in consistency in that? Why don't we deepen in our relationship with God? I think in part, there is an element that we have to learn about prayer that we may not know coming into it. Prayer is not just a natural response. And as a matter of fact, it's not natural at all. It is a supernatural response to the work of God in our hearts through the work of Jesus Christ. You know, the disciples, when they followed Jesus around, they, they didn't often ask him for advice or help with how to do things. It's remarkable when you think about it. When you think about Peter, who saw Jesus walking on the water to him, Peter does not ask the Lord, Lord, how are you doing that? 
he, he just says, Lord, is that you? Command me and I'll come out there too. If I was Peter, I'd want to know how the mechanics of it worked. And before I took a step out of the boat, what would happen if I did it? But Peter doesn't do that. He just steps right out and walks to the Lord. Uh, we know he sank, but for a little while he did walk. There were other times when Jesus would command the disciples, go and preach the gospel and cast out demons everywhere you find them. And the Bible doesn't record them saying to Jesus, how do we do that? They just go out and do it, and then they come back to Jesus and they say, Lord, we did it, and all these great things happened. But then you come to the topic of prayer. And in Luke chapter 11, verse one, the disciples come to Jesus and they say, Lord, teach us to pray. It's not quite how to pray. I mean, these were Jewish men. They grew up in the background of the Psalms and the worship of synagogues and the reading of God's word in the Old Testament, as we call it, and they would respond to God in prayer. They would see prayer modeled for them. But what they don't quite get is the depth of the prayer life that's possible in a, a person who follows Jesus and has that link to God himself. They want to know how to grow deeper in that prayer, what the priorities of it are. Because for every disciple, we struggle with prayer. We likewise should go to Jesus and say, teach us to pray. Likewise, go to him at times when we don't even feel the desire to pray and say, Lord, give us the desire to pray. Help us to want to pray. I want to want to pray. Help me to want to pray. Right? Coming to Jesus is the right move, and the disciples initiated that. And what we have in Luke 11, but more specifically in Matthew 6, is Jesus opening up the topic of prayer within the broader context of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. In that sermon, Jesus is talking about a righteousness that is required of God's people to enter the kingdom of God. And it's gotta be a righteousness that is better than the most righteous people that you know about. In the case of the disciples, it was the Pharisees and the scribes who dedicated their entire being and lives around knowing and studying God's word. And when the disciples would have heard you need to be more righteous than those guys, they would have been crushed. And so what Jesus does throughout the Sermon on the Mount is lay out the ethics of God's kingdom. In other words, this is how you will live now that God is initiating his kingdom in me. This is how the people will live in God's kingdom as his citizens, as his people. And when he gets to the topic of prayer, he's trying to clear up the hypocrisy that surrounds it, and get to clear teaching on what helps the disciples grow in their relationship with him. And this is what we find as a major theme this morning. Prayer is talking to God, but in particular, it's talking to God the Father with confidence in the person and work of Jesus. We're going to get into that, and at this point in the Gospels, that's as far as we get. Note, there's no mention of the Holy Spirit here, but this is what I would say, both in this time and in the time to come. What I could do in this definition is just say that prayer is talking to God the Father with confidence in the person and work of Jesus. That's why we pray in Jesus' name, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? That would come from Jesus later on, but he's emphasizing in particular our relationship with God the Father through his teaching today on prayer. So, this prayer has been quoted and recited and said in congregations for almost 2,000 years now, if you think about that. Across denominations, no matter where you go, you stay there long enough and people will bring this teaching out and say it. Um, it's not quite a creed of the church, but it is scripture that is so instrumental to our growth and understanding as disciples that it is talked about everywhere. So what I want to do this morning is go through line by line what Jesus has for us here in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Lord's Prayer, 
and then at the end, give some encouragement for how to apply some of these things. All right, so let's get into it. In the first place, we see that line, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is what Jesus says to pray like first. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, Father is a very rich word that Jesus repeats frequently in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. I would encourage you sometime in your personal Bible study to go through those chapters. And maybe if you're going through a yearly Bible reading program, you've already read these chapters uh, for this time of the year. Um, But what I did a long time ago was I went through and I highlighted every verse or underlined reference to that, that name, Father, anywhere that it appeared in Matthew 5 through 7. And my pages just lit up because Father is one of the predominant themes in our relating to the Father throughout the Sermon on the Mount, particularly in this prayer. Um, in Galatians chapter 4, 4 through 7, we see a scripture that recently Pastor Sam preached to us on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, but relates back to this issue of having God as our Father. It says there, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. It's a wonderful promise of God that when he initiates the relationship with us, he is the father of Jesus Christ. And he sent his son into this world to be born under the law and to become a curse under the law so that we who were held captive under the law of God and condemned by it could be forgiven and so that the penalty of the law could be put on him and so that we could escape that penalty and not only be forgiven and free, but included in the family of God. Thereby he sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying out that word, Abba. It really does mean daddy. The way that we relate to God is familial. It is intimate. It is a relationship that has family security. I didn't really know what it meant to be a father until I got married and had kids. I had had a father, and I kind of understood from his perspective kind of the things that he went through, but I certainly didn't experience it. But now that I am a dad, I think of my kids, and I really believe there's nothing they could do that would stop my love for them. There's, there's no place they could go. There's nothing that they could decide to do, even if they would wander far away, that would stop me from loving them. They would always be my kids, and I would love them. I mean, that's what I'm experiencing, what a dad is what a dad does and it's an amazing thing but you think about this there wasn't ever a time when god became a father god is the father sometimes we think that the holy spirit might have come up with language about fatherhood to help us who have fathers to understand god better but the reason that we are dads is because god is a dad (laughs) there's there's a a frame of reference that needs to shift in our thinking god is has always been a father. He has always been the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we who experience the joys of fatherhood here at the best of times can be brought into the family of God and experience the fatherhood that we've always longed for and that has always been the core of our need, that restored relationship to a dad that never fails, that always loves and that is there for us at all points because in calling out to God as such, the cross of Jesus and his empty tomb shines back their shadows on this text 
and is the foundation for why we can call out to God as Daddy and why we can relate to Him intimately in praise and thanks and security. We learn that God is in heaven. Now, this doesn't mean that He's far off somewhere and that if you get in a rocket ship, you can get there if you travel enough light years. On the one hand, this does talk spatially, but God is a spirit, and he does not dwell in some far-off planet somewhere or in some region, some galaxy far, far away. Um, The realm of heaven talks about the realm that cannot be touched by human designs or schemes and cannot be corrupted. In Psalm 2, We're reminded of the stakes of life and what's really going on. Here's what it says. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves up and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. So here you have God observing on the earth a collection of rulers and authorities who are trying to pool all of their resources, and the intent of that is to mock God and to throw him off, to say God is irrelevant and we're doing fine on our own. And the response of God in verse 4, he who sits in the heavens, that realm of incorruptibility, where God rules and reigns, where he is surrounded by innumerable angels. The Lord holds them, these nations who plot against him in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. You see, God's intent has always been in the face of rebellious humanity and the kingdoms of the earth that would unite against him to say, I will thwart all your designs by my one king, and I am sending him into the earth, and he will inaugurate my kingdom. And to him you must be loyal and show your fidelity by bowing and kissing his feet. And if you do not, he will crush you. Right, that's the promise of Psalm 2. So by the time Jesus has come, in Matthew 4, he begins preaching, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus, the king, has arrived. And when he says, God, our Father in heaven, he's come from heaven. He has come from the Father to inaugurate the mission of God on this earth. And so when we pray to our Father in heaven, we are praying to the God who is incorruptible, who is our intimate daddy, but at the same time, who is completely other than who we are sinless, absolutely holy. And that's why we likewise pray to him, hallowed be your name. Hallowed, another way to say that is, let your name be honored. Let your name be honored. God, I want people to respect you. I want people to use your name to worship you. And it grieves me, God, when people use your name in vain, when people say the name of the Lord in vain. God, may people grow to love you, to honor you, and to set you apart as unique and holy and one of a kind, worthy of worship. That's what this request is about. It orients us from the beginning of our prayer life. God, I want you to be known, and I want your fame to spread. So I I ask you at this point, do you trust in God as your father? Has your relationship with him been secured because of your faith in Jesus Christ? Well, let's go on. The second request says this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's interesting, before we ever get to the requests that deal with our personal needs, 
we're compelled to pray to God for things that are important to him. Note the pronouns here, your kingdom come, your will be done. When I think of the kingdom of Jesus, as I've said in here not long ago in our Christmas series on John 3, the kingdom of God is, in my mind, Jesus walking around and preaching, Jesus healing people, Jesus delivering captives, Jesus bringing the good news, people coming to faith, demons being cast out, people's body and minds and souls becoming whole, people worshiping God and coming together to have right relationships restored. The kingdom of God meets us where we are in our brokenness and transforms us. And so when we pray, God, let your kingdom come, we're saying, God, go out in this world, use me, use my friends, use my family, and may people come to know Jesus. May people become more connected to you. May people who are lost enter your kingdom. Use me in that way. God, this is first. Your glory, your kingdom's expansion, so that all the world may know that you are God. Likewise, we pray, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you think about it for a minute, in heaven, the angels fly around God, certain categories of angels do, and they, they cry out all the time, holy, holy, holy is our God. And that's pretty much their full-time job. They are consumed with a vision of who God is, and the response is immediate forgiveness, <laughs> immediate obedience. Sorry, wrong word there. They go and do anything that God says because they've seen him for who he is. And the response of us, Jesus says, needs to grow in that same way. As we experience God for who he is, then our desire will be for his will to be done here on earth. We know that God wills for people to come to know Jesus. We know that God wills for his church, the people in his church to be holy, for them to be sanctified, for them to control themselves in this increasingly godless society. He knows, we know that God's will is for us to be submissive and obedient. And as we submit to God's will, increasingly, we'll be reading God's word, seeing him for who he is. We want to pray that our response would be ever quicker to obey the Lord, that our response would grow in our desire to see people around us know and follow God and to do his will. We aim, as far as these first two requests go, typically really low when we pray. Often my prayers feel very ritualistic. They feel kind of like the same words that I repeat over and over again. And one of the things that's helped me in going back to the Lord's Prayer is remembering that I actually can begin with something that doesn't focus on me at all and orients me back to God as he truly is, and grow in the praise and adoration of my God, and begin from a standing point of more security than the anxiety-driven prayers that often consume me. You see, if we begin with ourselves, we often just rehearse in prayer the things that we're anxious about. But if we begin with God, we're reminded of the one who rules in the heavens, who can't be touched by all of the corruption in the world, who will not judge with partiality, who, who knows the true intentions and thoughts of each heart and will give us peace. But it begins by focusing on who he is, the peace that we desire, the provision, the protection that we need begins with understanding the Lord's presence. And so I would encourage you, friends, if your prayers feel like 
just a rehearsing of your anxieties, or if you find yourself praying the same things over and over again, then dig into God's word, particularly in the book of Psalms, and grow in your understanding of who God is and praise him for his character. Praise him for his works of redemption and history that may not even relate specifically to you in that moment, but are true just because they're true of God. Learn to praise him and experience that growth in your faith and the feeling and the sense of peace in your life. Now, God does care about our daily needs. And that's what Jesus focuses on in verse 11. Look at that with me. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Other commentators and Bible teachers have looked at these next three verses, and they say, and I agree with them, that these deal with the needs of provision, pardon, and protection. And so we'll look at them in those ways. In verse 11, we're, we're asking God to provide for us, to provide for us. One of the most shocking things on TV last week, and I think you probably agree with me, was the collapse of Buffalo Bills player DeMar Hamlin. Many of you perhaps saw that. Um, I didn't see it on Monday Night Football, but I saw it on the news the next day. You know, thank God DeMar is on the mend, and that's a miracle in light of the cardiac arrest he suffered that caused his collapse. Um, to what does DeMar owe his healing? I think, in no small part, it was the prayers of many to God on his behalf. Um, go ahead and throw up that picture. What was almost equally shocking to me, though, was seeing so many tough NFL players kneel down and pray together. And I, I don't believe for a minute that all of these guys are believers, right? But what does this illustrate? In a moment of extreme need, what's the gut reaction still, even in our culture today, of many people? Get down and pray. Right? When, when people sense that they're broken and that they don't have any other recourse, it seems like at that time, when everything else is stripped away, they pray. And that's why I think prayer is not just, it's not a mystery. It's not like we don't know how to do it. But at that moment, those players were burdened because they saw what happened. You know, a football game was canceled because of that, and I think rightly so. And those men got down and they prayed. Now, if that is an illustration, I think maybe... An equally shocking thing anymore right now would be for you and I to get down on our knees each morning with full refrigerators and pantries and a budget to enable us to go out to eat and to even buy expensive coffee drinks to pray to God, give me this day my daily bread. You know, I, I think this is one of the harder things for you and I to pray. But if we peel back the layers of our society, if we really looked at what our situation here is, we would find that we eat by the grace of God. There's a system in place that gets you and I our food. And I, I read a statistic a while back that if, like Kroger and Food City, didn't have any trucks delivering their food, and the last one was delivered today, they would run out of food in three days. Isn't that crazy? I don't say that to scare you, but I say that to point out that we are dependent on a delicate infrastructure and of all times in the history of the world, we're a bit spoiled. And I'm not trying to shame you any more than I'm trying to put guilt on myself, but what that has caused me to do is to say, God, thank you for keeping this world running. Thank you for managing each step of the way so that I could have food on the table for myself and my family this morning. God, keep it up. You know, this, this is dependent on your oversight over this whole world. My small part in it, God, I can't think it's my creativity or cleverness that puts money in the bank. God, you have provided 
continue to provide or we won't be able to continue serving you and expanding your kingdom if we're in the grave. I think we need to pray like King Lemuel in Proverbs 30. Listen to what he said as he prayed to the Lord. Two things I ask of you. Deny them not to me before I die. Remove from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Times of ex- excess, excess and plenty and times of famine and deep need can reveal the true character in us. I think what Lemuel is asking of God is worthy of us to pray to him on a daily basis. God, provide me what I need. Don't give me way too much, and don't give me so little that I'm tempted to deny you or to profane you. God, I depend on you, right? This is the attitude that needs to grow, perhaps in us 21st century American people more than than any other, is this attitude of true dependence and a recognition that God truly provides. And he's the one behind all of our successes. He's the one who is giving us what we need from the clothes on our back to the homes that we live in to the jobs that we have to the food that we eat. And we eat pretty good. So praise the Lord for that, but continue to express your dependence as a creature onto your creator, as a child to your loving father. Um, The next is this, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. This is our need of pardon, pardon. We need provision, but we also need pardon. Spiritually speaking, this issue of forgiveness is a daily thing, and that's why Jesus talked to his disciples and he talks to us to pray to God, just like we say, give me my food that I need today. Pray to God, forgive me of my debts today, like I forgive others who are my debtors. Isaiah 55, six and seven says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Praise God, that's a good word, that if you come to God and you daily confess your sins, he doesn't beat you up for it. He doesn't tell you how evil you are. He doesn't point out other people who are getting it right and saying, why can't you be like them? He delights to abundantly pardon you. It's his character and grace to forgive you. And it's not just, I'm not saying it's it's his job. I'm saying through Jesus, he has provided the pardon so that just like we sang when we sang, yet not I, but Christ in me, I am forgiven. The debt has been paid. But in this, it's the daily disruptions that come when we allow sins between us and God and between us and other people to fester and not get taken care of. Jesus says on a daily basis, go to God and be honest about what you've done and how you've offended other people and how you've offended God. So last night, as our family was driving home from community group, um, I learned from my wife that some of the kids didn't get along while us adults were upstairs in the group time. And uh, we said to the kids on the way home in the car, you know, sometimes adults have disagreements too. And my daughter was surprised by this and she asked, do you adults hit each other too? And uh, I told her, thankfully, no, that's most of the case that doesn't happen. (laughs) We don't go off when we have a disagreement and just sock somebody. Um, But I got to thinking about that. You know, sometimes the kids uh, get into their fights and with kids, it's just a little bit more, more raw and real, 
Like wherever they're at, whatever they're doing, they get into it. I'm not condoning fighting, but I'm saying sometimes better out than in. It's, it, it's good to get it out. It's good to know what's happening in the heart so that you can deal with it. But uh, for us adults, it seems like it takes a long time for us to actually offend each other and then ask for forgiveness and make it right. You know, for years I've said, as I've preached to people, and I've said it here before and I'm sure I'll say it again, you know, we're not really deep in relationship until we've hurt one another and asked forgiveness and been reconciled to each other. So don't try to avoid conflict, right? In some ways, Jesus expects it of his disciples. And when we pray, we should regularly think about, right, who is my debtor, right? So like today, if, if that, when I read that verse, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Is there someone who comes to your mind as a debtor to you because of what they've done to you? Is there someone that you today have not forgiven? Is there somebody that you're holding a grudge about in your heart? Or whoever that is, that debtor is, that comes to your mind. I would say that's something to pray about as we close here in just a few minutes. Because the reality is, in light of the massive, massive pardon that God has given us for the sins that we have done against him and continue to do, whatever someone else has done against you or me is light in comparison. And so that's why Jesus says, you know, in verse 14, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Right? There's no room for justification to holding on to grudges and bitterness in your heart. Because the true stakes are, if you are in Christ, you know that you have been forgiven much. Much. My sins, they are many. His mercy is more. And if you believe that, that's the fuel to give you the power that you don't have to forgive others. Meditating much on the cross and on the finished work of Jesus for you can soften you to make you a forgiving person. And that's what Jesus wants us to pray for, for ourselves and for others. The last request is lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And this gets into our need for protection. You know, our, our needs compass the past, that's our sin debts, our present, that's our daily bread, and the future, deliverance from temptation and the evil one. We have an enemy that longs to trip us up. You, your spouse, your friends, your kids, his aim is to target them and to capture them as his own for eternity. He does not want Jesus to win. And when we pray, God, protect me from the evil one. Lord, deliver me from temptation today. That's a person, that's a follower of Jesus going with both eyes open out into his day or her day. You know, if you pray this, whether you are dealing with a temptation to lust or an overindulgence in something or a bitter spirit or lying to protect or promote yourself, as much as you want, want to be free of those things, or might say you want to be free of those things, if you don't look them square in the face, and if you don't call them out for what they are, and actually in humility name your temptation, then you won't talk to God about it, you won't ask to be protected from it, and you won't be delivered. You'll fall into a trap again and again and again. But Jesus wants us to grow in our relationship to God so that we will name what tempts us to God. We will take it to him in prayer and say, God, I know this is gonna trip me up uh, when I'm driving that direction, when I see that, or when I talk to this person at work, or when I see that family member again and I just feel those feelings inside, it's coming. Lord, deliver me from the temptation to be bitter. Deliver me when I'm on that route from the temptation of lust. Deliver me from that lying tongue 
that steps into that situation and makes myself look good. I know it's coming. Lord, deliver me from the evil one. Right? This is the direction Jesus gives us. And at times our prayers are, deliver me, Lord. Father, don't let me go down that old road again. You've promised you will protect me, and I am counting on you. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed that prayer and with the sincerity of my heart been honest to God about what I am facing in terms of a temptation, and God has delivered me every time. He's not lying when he says he will provide a way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10. God will provide. God will pardon. God will protect you. Seek him for those things. Let him know that although he knows you need them, he loves to hear you ask him for those things and to plead on your behalf and on behalf of others. So let me give you some encouragements as we close. The first is this. Pray privately, but prioritize praying with your church. You know, in, in the beginning of Matthew 6, Jesus talks about how it's necessary to go into your room and shut the door and pray and pray in secret, and God who sees secretly will reward you. There is a time for private prayer, and you need to grow in that. But I hope you noticed that in this prayer, there was the third person pronoun over and over again. Our Father, give us, forgive us, deliver us. So here's what I would say. Learn from the prayers of others. On the one hand, I'm thankful for my relationship with my wife. Praying out loud with my wife instructs me maybe deeper than any other thing because she's the closest relationship I have. Hearing how she talks to God informs my prayers and makes me think, whoa, I didn't think to ask God for that, but that's a really good thing to ask him for. I need to start doing that. Or even if it's just like, yes, Lord, me too. Yes, Lord, I need that. Just to echo when you pray with other people. I pray with certain people in this church and I feel like they have a golden line to heaven. And I wanna pray with those people all the time. They're not showy, they're not arrogant in their prayers, they're not trying to be known by many words. It just, it just seems like when they talk to God, they love him and I feel that love too. All right, we need to pray with others and to put ourselves in a situation where we can do that more and more. One of the things that's been so helpful for me is Al Cage. I'll give credit where credit is due. Um, Al leads um, many initiatives to pray, but one of the best things he's done is to write up prayers for men to pray for their wives and sends those out on a weekly basis. As he continues to do things like that, man, dudes, get with Al and let him instruct you on how to pray specifically for your wives. Um, number two, get specific. I would, I would ask you, who is the us to you as you read the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us. You know, provide for us. Keep track of who you're praying for and ask God to continue to show you how he's answering those prayers. One example that a guy named John Owen Chekwa, I don't think I ever say his name right. He's a pastor down in Atlanta. He's written a couple of books on prayer. And he said, you know, when you're praying for God to provide for your needs and provide for your, your friend, perhaps your friend loses his job but gives you a promotion and now you've got a lot more money. Might it be that God's provision and his plan is for some of that money to be used to bless and to help your friend for you to grow in generosity and for that friend to grow in humility? Those are things that God wants to produce in us. Who is the us that God wants you to learn to support and to focus. I'm not saying that you pick up someone's salary forever and ever. But what I'm saying is, are you looking for God to answer prayer? Are you willing to be specifically a part of that answer sometimes if God leads you in that way? Use a helpful memory tool. Um, there are several. Pray is praise, repent, ask, and yield. That's what we use most often in our REAP studies. We want to encourage that. There's also ACTS. Maybe you've heard of that. Adoration, confession, thanks, and supplication. Right? These take elements from the Lord's Prayer, a little disordered, but we praise God for who he is, 
ask him for his pardon and confess our sins, ask him for our daily needs and for his kingdom and, and will to be done, and then we say, but not my will, but yours be done, Father. And Pastor Sam, you know, he's given us prism. I don't know if he came up with that. I've seen other people do it. Maybe they've stolen from Pastor Sam. That's a possibility. He's written a book about it, and it's a helpful book. He says to focus on praise, repentance, intercession, specific requests, and meditation. I know from time to time he, he teaches on that. And again, he's written um, a book that you can buy here through our resources. And I would say, finally, pray the Bible. Pray the Bible. There's really no better way to pray than in response to what you read about God. If it's true, one thing in my prayers, they, like I said, become very repetitive. I say the same things over and over again. But when I focus on who God is and read about him, particularly, again, in the Psalms, or if I'm reading here in the book of Matthew, for example, I want to focus on who Jesus is so that I can praise him and worship him in response to what he has said to me. The Bible is God speaking to you and me. Our prayer is response in that relationship back to the Father in the work of Jesus Christ and the power of the Spirit. So I'm gonna conclude here just with one minute of quiet for, to give you an opportunity to pray. Um, we rush out of here so often, we're gonna sing one song, but we rush out of here and lose the opportunity to personalize these things in a time of dedicated prayer. So whatever it might be, a repentance, a praise, asking God, yielding to him, um, take a minute to do that, and then I'll close us in prayer, and then Dan and Amy and the team will come up. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word that instructs us in the content of our prayers. Although these, these prayers that you give, um, and this one in particular, is a model for our, our praying, I pray that if we pray the very words, that you would help us to do so from the heart, but that you would help us to grow in talking to you about these things that are your values and our great need, and to grow um, in our relationship with you, our awareness of you and what you're doing. Lord, may, may your will be done, and may our confidence be in Christ, in Christ alone. And it's in his name I pray, amen.